the gods in Asgard, they had a problem. And like any problem in Asgard, you can bet your bottom dollar it begins with our favourite god of mischief. That's right, it's Loki. Loki. Oh, Loki, so misunderstood. <laughs> you know, I feel sorry for Loki a lot of the time. He's much maligned. You know, Loki's done a lot of good for the gods in Asgard. He helped, by trickery, build that wall around Asgard. He helped win Thor's hammer from the realm of the dwarves. He helped rescue Freya and Idun from the realm of the giants. Okay, he might have had a hand in their being captured in the first place, but come on, he's done a lot of good in Asgard, even if it's by slippery ways. But you know, Loki didn't get the kudos that he felt he deserved, and he was being resented by a lot of the gods, and in truth, he resented them too. Resentment was brewing in Asgard. Loki, he was... He was pretty pleased with himself a lot of the time. He always had a little smirk on his face and oftentimes he would just disappear from Asgard. He would up sticks and leave. He wouldn't tell anyone where he was going, not even his poor, long-suffering wife. And he would always return after a time away with a little smirk on his twisted little face. <laughs> you know, he was handsome. Loki, and he knew it, and the gods suspected he was up to no good, you know? Playing the field, playing away from home, as they say. But this one time, Loki had been away for a very, very long time, you know, coming up to a year, and Odin was starting to have bad dreams, strange dreams about the end of days. And then these dreams would always end in the same way. A great pair of jaws swallowing up the sun and the moon and the earth and him. And then he would wake up. This troubled Odin. So what did he do? What he always did. He sent out his two ravens, thought and memory, and they swooped out over the nine realms, over the realm of men and over the realms of giants to try and get some sense of some whisperings of what Loki might be up to. And when they returned, they did indeed bring news. Loki had been having an affair, an affair with a witch, with a giantess named Angraboda. And what's more, she had given birth to three of Loki's children. Well, Odin held council with the other gods and it was decided that they would have to go on a journey into giant land and get these children of Loki back so they could not be used as a weapon against the gods. So off they went, a band of the best gods, of course, among them was Tyr, son of Odin, the sword champion, prince of gods, the most courageous of all the gods. Thor also would be there with his hammer, the smasher of giants. Why wouldn't he go? And of course, Odin the wise with his spear. Well, they journeyed long across Midgard, the realm of humans, in human form so as not to be recognised, until... They crossed the great river and into giant land, and they met very little resistance. Normally when Thor goes into giant land, he had to do quite a lot of smashing on the way, you know, but not this time. Things were eerily quiet. And then they came to the house of Angraboda, and there were the three children of Loki. They were greed, hatred, and fear given. Form. The first of these was a girl, quiet, unassuming, pale, long dark hair covering half of her face. Pretty to look at, she was handsome like her father Loki with one green eye, but when she peeled back the hair on the other side of her face, it was rotten with maggots coming out of her eye sockets. One half of her was a corpse, the other half a living girl. And her name was Hela. 
The second child of Loki was a great writhing serpent, venom pouring from its jaws, and it was a fearsome thing to behold. And right away, Thor leapt on it and pinned its head to the ground so it could not thrash and bite, and he bound up its head tightly <clears throat> and wrapped it round his own waist. <clears throat> Only Thor could be strong enough to do this, I imagine. And then there was the third child of Loki, just a little puppy, cute little wolf cub. And this tear scooped up into his arms, and the three gods led the three children of Loki back to Asgard, Hela following behind Odin solemnly, like a little goth child behind. Angraboda let them leave, and Odin wondered, strange, that none of the giants followed them out of giant land. This did not bode well. So, when they reached Asgard again, <clears throat> Odin decided what he was going to do with these three children of Loki. It was a bit of a conundrum. First, they had to deal with that serpent, that worm, that great dragon. And Odin said, Thor, throw that snake into the ocean. Now Thor, huge, vast, strong god that he was, grabbed that snake and he waded right out, right up to his chest far, far, far out into the ocean, and with all his strength, he flew that, through that serpent all the way to the edge of the ocean that encircles the whole world. And it, spiralling down, swam to the very depths of the ocean where it remained, growing larger and larger and larger until it too encircled the whole world and hang on, bit onto its own tail, and men call it the Midgard Serpent, the World Serpent. We see it in many, many mythologies. Next was that young girl, that young adolescent that we call Hel or Hela. Odin said, are you living or are you dead? And Hel said, Neither. I'm just hell. Freaky. <laughs> so Odin said again, do you prefer the company of the living or the dead? And Hela looked up and for the first time something like a smile crossed her pale lips and she said, oh, the dead, the living look at me with revulsion. I much, much prefer the company of the dead. Well then, said Odin, in his wisdom, would you like to be queen of the underworld and all the souls of the dead? And she smiled and said, I do. So Odin showed her the way down through strange paths, all the way into the realm of the underworld, the realm of the dead, the realm where souls that have died dishonorably go, those that die of disease or old age or in accidents or are murdered. A bit harsh, the old age one, isn't it? But anyway, that's where all the, all the souls that do not go up to Asgard or up to Valhalla descend. It's like Hades in Greek mythology. And that's where we get the term hell. And Hela ruled over them. So that's the snake taken care of. That's the weird emo kid taken care of. Now to deal with the dog, or the wolf, I should say. Now on the journey back from Giant Land, Tyr, who had been, you know, feeding that pup little bits of meat and, you know, just stroking it behind the ear and playing with it. And it had been, you know, chewing on his thumbs and things like that. And, ow, really quite painful. This dog was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, it started off this size and soon it was the size of a horse. And Tyr couldn't really control it anymore. And it was getting a bit problematic. But, you know, Tyr, he said, oh, I've got this, guys. I'll look after this one. And sure enough, the most courageous of all the gods, the sword champion Tyr, was the only one that could really approach Fenris, the wolf, as his name was. 
and he would feed that dog every day and every day that that wolf would grow bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually Tyr was just you know feeding whole oxen whole animals alive to this wolf who would um feed them up and every day he would say to his adopted father Tyr because you know Loki was absentee father at this point no one knew where he had gone so Tyr was like dad to this wolf and, and Fenris would say, you see how big I'm growing, Dad. And Tyr would say, yeah, you're a very big, strong boy. But you see, it was not food that that wolf was growing large on. It was fear. The fear of the gods. All the gods except Tyr. Even Odin feared <clears throat> that wolf. But then Odin had bad dreams. So day by day by day, Fenris grew larger and larger and larger until he brushed the very branches of the very highest treetop of Idrasil. He was higher than the halls of all the gods and he would just walk through Asgard and everything would shake when he walked around. And eventually the gods held council and decided something must be done. And there was a lot of argument and Tyr was sort of sticking up for Fenris and Thor was saying, I'll just smash him on the head. But it seemed that he couldn't really be, they couldn't, they, 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 they could not put him down, but they could not leave the situation as it was. And eventually it was decided that they would bind Fenris. They would just tie him up like we do with a, with a dangerous dog, right? Muzzle him and put him in a kennel somewhere. That was the best thing. It wasn't an ideal situation, but it was, meh, it was good enough. So, the gods set about making the strongest and largest set of chains, set of shackles and fetters that had ever been made on earth before. And they worked long and hard, you know, smithing these iron chains. And then they went with these chains to Fenris and said, Fenris, I've got a game for you. Why don't we see if you can break these chains? Do you think you're strong enough? And Fenris, who had a human voice, of course, laughed and said, of course I can break these chains. And they clapped them on him and he just stretched his great wolf body and boom, he shattered the chains. And the next day at feeding time, when Tyr went to feed Fenris, Fenris said, did you see, did you see how I broke those chains? And Tyr said, I did. I did. Well done. Do you think they will try stronger chains? And Tyr said, you know, I'm sure they will. And Fenris said, good, with a growl. I can't wait to break them too. <laughs> the next day, sure enough, the gods had forged an even stronger set of chains and they slapped these on Fenris and said, can you break these? And sure enough, Fenris stretched with all his might and broke them. But Fenris, you know, he noted the gods didn't necessarily seem overjoyed with his uh, great feat of strength and he started to suspect that perhaps something was not right the gods for their part knew that they did not have the craft or the skill or the power to make a set of chains strong enough to bind fenris but they knew who did they knew the dwarfs had that skill that cunning and that craftsmanship. So Odin went down, down to the realm of the dwarfs, the realm of the dark elves with a proposition and a challenge. He said, I need a chain strong enough to bind the great wolf Fenris. Surely you have heard his footprints from all the way down here. Surely your own dwarven halls have trembled to his mighty growl. And the dwarf said, we have heard. We have heard, and we will accept the challenge, but it's going to cost you. <laughs> They're clever dwarfs. <laughs> and Odin said, name your price. I don't know what the price was, but you betcha it was high. And the dwarfs, cunning dwarfs, they knew that the only way to bind Fenris was to be making chains out of things that did not exist because how can you break something that does not exist <laughs> so the dwarves found all sorts of non-existent things for example the tears of a fish 
the beard of a woman. Pretty sure I've seen a bearded woman. But anyway, the footfall of a cat, the roots of a mountain, all these things that do not exist in nature. The dwarves fabricated the most beautiful chain in existence. And it was not big and bulky like the chains of the gods. It was light and soft as a silken ribbon and it could be placed into the palm of a hand. And Odin took this chain up to Asgard and showed it to the other gods. And then they said to Fenris, another game. This time, here, try this chain on. And they had gone for their game all the way to an island at the far edge of the world. And Fenris looked at this chain. And his eyes, his great wolf eyes, narrowed in suspicion. First, he said, there is no honour in breaking such a puny chain. And Thor began to laugh and said, ha, 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 you know, you cannot break such a chain, mocked Thor. And Fenris, you know, rose to the challenge and said, of course, of course I can break the chain. I can break anything. I'm Fenris. I'm the most powerful being in the cosmos. But I do not trust that if, if, just if, just if, if I cannot break the chains, I do not believe that you will release me. Odin, all father, you never break an oath, said Fenris. <clears throat> you tell me, tell me that you will release me. Odin said to Fenris, you have my word. You have all of our words. We will release you. Fenris said, on one condition, as a um, article of faith, as an article of good faith, one of you gods, one of you Aesir, must place your right hand, your oath-giving hand, into my mouth. And if in the very, 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 very unlikely scenario when I can't break out of these measly, pathetic chains. I will bite off your hand. Well, the gods looked at each other. Odin looked to Thor. Thor looked to Balder. Balder looked to Hone. Hone went, Oop. and finally, only one of the gods stood forward. It was. Of course, Tyr. It had to be. There was something of a look in Fenris's eye, I like to believe. It was, no, not you. But Tyr stood forward, raised his right hand, and placed it in the mouth of his faithful canine companion. I don't think it's too much to say that. And then the gods set about binding the legs of Fenris. Bound them tight, bound them strong. And then the gods said, now, mighty Fenris, with a smirk on their faces, break these meagre bonds. And Fenris tried. He stretched every sinew on his vast body, the size of a mountain, vaster than a mountain. He heaved and heaved and heaved and heaved. But he could not break the chains. Finally, after totally exhausting himself, he lay down, tears, hand still in his mouth, and he waited. He thought, they said they would release me. Now, surely, is the time. And time rolled on, moments stretching out like years, and they did not release him. But then, one of the gods, I would say probably Thor, began to laugh, chuckle, laughing, laughing, until it was a great boom. And then Balder too started to laugh, his laugh. And then Heimdall started to laugh, his self-important chuckle. All the gods started to laugh, laugh at the foolishness, the stupidity, the gullibility, the pride, the hubris of this so-called monstrous cosmic wolf Fenris. But you know who wasn't laughing? Fenris wasn't laughing. You know who else wasn't laughing? Tyr 
wasn't laughing. And then Fenris looked into Tyr's eyes and it wasn't anger, it wasn't hatred. No, it was betrayal. And then Tyr, he could have probably slipped that hand quickly out. Maybe that's what you would have done, but not Tyr. Tyr had honour. And he looked at his long-time companion and just nodded wordlessly. And Fenris ow, bit Tyr's hand clean off. And without saying a word, without a scream, without even a little utterance of, of sound, Tyr removed his bloody stump from Fenris's mouth and put his other hand over it. And now, to this day, the wrist is called the wolf joint. <clears throat> and Fenris then howled, screamed betrayal at the gods, screamed betrayal at his, his one-time foster father, Tyr, and most of all, he screamed at Odin, who had broken that oath. And he said, one day, Odin, I will be the end of everything. I will eat the sun and the moon and the stars. I will destroy the entire world and I will destroy you at Ragnarok, the end of days. This will happen. And Odin, because he had seen it in his dreams, knew too that that was too 